Welcome to The Bonfire. I am Morgan, aka Bond Diesel, and this is a podcast about video game news, speculation, rumors, and reviews. This week, I'll be covering Xbox finally acquiring ABK, PlayStation 5's new refresh, Disney potentially buying EA, and much more. A few things before we get started. Subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform and on YouTube. Please subscribe to the channel, hit the like button if you do, join as a member if you want to, and comment with your thoughts, questions for next week, or to just say hello. A special thank you to all of my patrons, including producer-level patrons Hassan, supporter-level patrons PK, The Dawn, Cage Nephilim, and Neuronix, as well as viewer-level patron Zenra. If you're interested in supporting this podcast and getting ad-free episodes for as little as $1 per month, please check out patreon.com slash bonddiesel. This week we have like six or seven topics. The first one being Xbox acquires Activision Blizzard King. Uh, on Friday, uh, the CMA, uh, the, the, the British authority on trade and, and all of uh, the regulatory stuff that comes with these acquisitions, uh, finally uh, approved the deal um, that's been going on for nearly two years. Uh, it seems like what finally got them through was a deal that Basically, they made where Ubisoft will be the right holder to streaming any of the Activision Blizzard King games. But then the impression I'm under is that in theory, Ubisoft could license it out. And there's a possibility that one day Ubisoft license it back to Activision. (laughs) And so there's this weird situation where basically ubisoft could end up just being a middleman that makes money off of this uh but it seems like for right now and they've already made a statement that these games that they have the rights to uh will be coming to uh, ubisoft plus their uh their monthly subscription service but that's only going to be in england everywhere else it's going to be through game pass it's a weird situation even more weird is that the investigations aren't actually over with this. Um, For the most part, they are. The the big one that still remains is the FTC in the United States uh, still has an ongoing case. The thing is that now that this deal has gone through and all the papers have been signed, it's nearly impossible for the FTC uh, to, to split this up at this point especially when their case has already been floundering so badly. And what's most likely is concessions. What's most likely is that at some point they're going to say, hey, you need to agree to this and this and this. Uh, And Xbox is just going to be like, whatever. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) just leave us alone. What's weird is as someone who's been an Xbox fan for quite a while, I had a a PlayStation 3 for a couple months, but otherwise I was a 360 guy. I had an Xbox One um, and I had a, um, and I have a Series X. And it's just weird to think that now first party games and franchises with Xbox are Call of Duty, Diablo, World of Warcraft, Candy Crush, Crash Bandicoot, Spyro the Dragon, and many more. Um, it, it doesn't make, it just doesn't feel like it makes a difference today. Um, I'm sure in the long run, when we start seeing some of these games come out, um, it'll have more of an impact. We know Call of Duty is going to stay on all platforms for at least, I believe the next 10 years. Um, Diablo, you know, it's a pretty good chance Diablo 5 is going to be a, an exclusive game. World of Warcraft, that, that's an interesting one because there's a lot of theories that maybe having like the PC Game Pass will give you like a discount on the monthly subscription for World of Warcraft or something. Um, it's hard to tell. And then games like Candy Crush and, and stuff like that. Who knows? Uh, Crash Bandicoot, 
uh, Spyro the Dragon and, and just a multitude of other IPs that are under this acquisition. You know, all of those games will probably come to Game Pass. And then you're looking at a world of what does a Bobby Kodakless Activision what are they allowed to do? Are they going to have all of the studios continue to, to do the same things that they've been doing? Are they going to finally kind of let some of these studios cook and do their own thing? Um, you know, it's no doubt that even under Xbox leadership, you know, Call of Duty is still going to be a very big uh, focus. It's part of why you make this deal. And, though it's mostly King. What got lost in all of this is that King is is really probably the the biggest acquisition here um candy crush has been the most popular pc or a uh, mobile game it, for, it's been like 15 years or something like it's some stupid number where it's just been raking in cash for many many years um speaking of bobby kodak um he has revealed that he plans to stay on through the rest of this calendar year and will likely retire or leave uh, with a big giant golden parachute um, at the end of this year. Uh, it, it, it's been interesting seeing a lot of ABK employees like kind of celebrating this acquisition. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of mixed feelings about acquisitions, but I had even predicted for a long time that if this deal had fallen through, I think you would have seen an exodus from all three of these studios or all three of these uh, you know, game uh, consortiums or whatever. Um, because I think people just feel yucky being under Bobby Kodak. And I think that, you know, for all of Xbox's faults, I suspect these studios and, you know, the studios within all of these companies, uh, many of those workers were kind of holding out hope that maybe simply just having that figurehead go away and maybe being under the leadership, quote unquote, of Xbox would just make things a little better. And, you know, that's yet to be seen. So um, hopefully that's what happens and it, it probably is what's going to happen, but we'll have to wait and see. With games like Modern Warfare 3, which is coming out soon, and Diablo 4, which came out earlier this year, it's not expected for those games to hit Game Pass, at least for a while. Um, Modern Warfare 3 is part of, a, I believe, a nine year deal. Uh, that expires uh, in a year or two for Call of Duty and PlayStation. There's a huge marketing deal uh, that PlayStation did years ago. That's why you always see uh, the betas and the tests for Call of Duty um, are always on PlayStation first, uh, if they ever come to Xbox at all. And unless there's some big buyouts that happen, Xbox is going to abide by those uh, agreements. And the, I believe many of the deals that Sony signs uh, with various games and publishers and studios is a like a non Game Pass uh, part of it where they basically say like you can't put this game on Game Pass or at least like you can't do it for so long um, if you do a marketing deal with us. And it appears that's what's going on with Modern Warfare 3. Um, it, I would imagine most of the other, rest of the back catalog will show up on Game Pass pretty quickly, especially, obviously, games that are already on the Xbox uh, service that you could buy anyways. They're just going to tack them on to the Game Pass. Um, it, it is uh, kind of interesting to um, think about the types of games that they may bring back. There's lots of rumors of people hoping they bring back like the Tony Hawk Pro Skater and uh, Rock Band and, and various games and, and things like that. So we'll have to wait and see. Um, my kind of overall feeling on this acquisition, um, I'm not as anti-consolidation as other people are. Um, I have found that when these big consolidations happen, uh, that typically a lot of the leadership in the in the studios that are acquired um, have stock options and stuff. And when a sale like this happens, the, those stocks uh, explode. And when they vest and they're able to uh, sell them, a lot of um, these individuals who have been working uh, in, in ABK and or in the game industry for a long time um, will sell off and, and leave and start their own companies. And so these acquisitions tend to lead to you know veteran devs starting new studios, and that's cool. Now, 
what we've seen here in the last year or two, a lot of those studios fail and a lot of them don't make it. And so maybe it's not as good of a thing as, as I originally thought. Um, but I still think that what, what's interesting is that even after this deal, uh, Xbox is still the only the third largest gaming company when it comes to revenue. Uh, number one is Tencent, number two is PlayStation, and number three is um, a few. There's a few others, uh, but then Xbox and Activision combined, or uh, Xbox and ABK combined, does bring it up to the third largest. And like Sony needs competition, and we'll talk about more more about Sony later in this show. They're they're just dominant. They're so dominant in this um, in this uh, category. Their platform is outselling, you know, even the current gen Xbox by quite a bit. Um, exact figures are kind of unknown. Neither of these companies are super transparent about their sales. Um, but if there's a two to one sale ratio, I wouldn't be surprised at all. That seems likely, if not guaranteed. Um, if you do count the Series S and X together, maybe the ratio is a little better. Um, but at the end of the day, they're selling a lot more PlayStations than Xbox is selling Xboxes. And I, I just think, you know, and then Nintendo's kind of off doing its own thing, kicking butt and having their own new console next year and stuff, more than likely. Um, I just, competition's good. We didn't see much of it in the last gen, the PS4, Xbox One gen. Um, I, I can barely remember any games that Xbox even put out during that gen. Um, I had a lot of fun with the third party games in that gen, and I loved my Xbox One X. It was great. Um, but I, I just, I will never pretend like consolidations and stuff are ideal. Uh, there very likely are going to be um, some layoffs and stuff like that. That's just how these things tend to work. Um, the acquiring company notices uh, that at least in their own way of looking at things, there's wastes of resources and things like that. And it's very possible they, they could decide to cut things there. Um, that's obviously going to make a lot of people angry, especially in a year that's had over like, well, it's been like 6,000 or something layoffs in the games industry this year. Uh, you know, it, it's hopefully that's not what happens. Overall, as an Xbox fan, though, I, I can't act like I'm not excited to have all these games on Game Pass and to have the future games on Game Pass and things like that. Um, I just I, I, I just hope it works out. And at the end of the day, uh, where we leave this story is Xbox has even less of an excuse to not put out games. Um, you know, obviously, they're going to have to spin up these studios and uh, under their own culture and stuff like that. That's going to take a few years. But, you know, they're um, especially by the next gen of consoles, which, which is expected in the next four or five years, that they're, they're just going to have no excuse to not be extremely competitive with PlayStation. Um, and, and I guess Nintendo to a point, even though, you know, they almost seem like they're in a different uh, business at this point. But yeah, another acquisition story that has popped up and kind of gone away already is. Uh, Disney exploring uh, getting into the gaming industry. Um, Disney currently is a pretty big license uh, seller for gaming. So any Star Wars game that you see uh, and, and then any kids game you see basically that has to do with any of like anything Disney, uh, Paw Patrol and like all of those kind of things. If, if you see that, uh, maybe not Paw Patrol actually, but a lot of the gaming properties that are kid related, especially anything that's blatantly Disney, is them selling off that license to a studio to make a game. Uh, well, now the thought is that Disney saw how strong gaming was through the pandemic and how well all of these other entertainment industries faltered and fell apart and basically failed that gaming flourished, in fact. Um, and it seems like they want to get into that. Disney has had gaming studios in the past um, with, with mixed success. Uh, and, and this uh, led to um, some rumors and some discussion about how uh, Disney was potentially wanting to acquire EA, Electronic Arts. Um, this, uh, I think especially after this saga 
of the Xbox ABK acquisition, I feel like so many people, especially journalists at this point, just like roll their eyes and be like, come on, no more. Please don't do this to us. Just no more. I don't want to do this anymore. And, and I don't blame people. Um, me saying that I'm not really the most anti-consolidation type on earth. Um, this seems like a nightmare scenario, in my opinion. Um, EA is a studio or a publisher that is probably doing better than most people realize. Obviously, they have their annual sports games that just rake in hilarious amounts of cash. Uh, whether they deserve it or not is obviously subjective. Um, but they've even found success recently in, you know, like games as, as a service with Apex Legends, with games like uh, Jedi Survivor, and have, and getting back to, you know, hey, we make single player games and people really like them and they buy a lot of them and they get reviewed really well and it looks really good for us, especially when EA was a big pusher, you know, not that long ago of saying that like single player games are dead and it's all about live service and co-op and blah, blah, blah. Well, I think that tune is starting to change uh, with most of the big publishers uh, and especially EA. We know that we've got uh, another Jedi game coming. Uh, we've, uh, we've had games this year like the Dead Space remake, which was amazing, which was so good. And maybe there's some future and more of those kind of games. Uh, we have Bioware doing Bioware things and trying to finish up Dragon Age Dreadwolf in the next year, uh, as well as doing early work on the next Mass Effect game. Um, it, I believe Respawn is supposed to be working on multiple single-player games right now, um, as well as Apex, uh, maybe a Titanfall one day. Um, it, it seems like they're in a decent spot. And what worries me with an acquisition from someplace like Disney is like in a theoretical Disney acquisition of EA, Bioware would be in trouble. They, they just would be, I, I'm afraid. Um, like I've said quite often, I've seen a lot of people being like, oh, Dragon Age Dreadwolf is Bioware's last chance or else they're going to get shut down. I, I have said repeatedly, I don't believe that's true. Um, I, I suspect that Dragon Age Dreadwolf is a known quantity amongst uh, EA, and they understand that you know the goal there is probably to break even on development costs because that game has been in development for so long and had so much, so many issues. Uh, where the next Mass Effect game is probably really their do or die game, um, for better or worse. Uh, but a studio in that situation that hasn't had a big hit game since 2013 or 14 with Inquisition. Um, which has had a couple follies in recent years. Uh, you know, the Legendary Edition was obviously a really uh, a big deal. But, you know, a, a thing that is concerning about a, a Disney pickup of this, especially where Disney is just seeving money everywhere when it comes to their streaming and their other media, is I f would fear for you know studios like Bioware and stuff like that in this in this case. Now more reporting on this has come out and, and kind of dismissed this as a serious idea. It was more of a thing floated, uh, similar to when the big Xbox leak happened, and we saw that Xbox basically evaluated every option for acquisition, even if there was no serious move to make any of those acquisitions. It was just more of a uh, a, a brainstorming activity, I guess. Uh, so this is one that, you know, I, I kind of hope doesn't happen, even though in some ways it does kind of make sense for both parties. Um, I, I would really hate to see EA uh, squander a lot of the good faith it's gotten in recent years from starting to act kind of like a decent company again. So we will see. This does lead to a question of like, what is the next big acquisition? I... I don't know if we'll ever see another acquisition as big as this as ABK in the gaming industry, at least not anytime soon. Um, I think the only equivalent would be if someone bought like 2K games or, or, or something like that, because even a buy of like Ubisoft wouldn't be that like, it'd be big, but it wouldn't be that big. Um, we're going to have to see what happens to Embracer, uh, the Embracer group, which has is a giant uh, publisher at this point, but they don't publish anything. All of the studios they've purchased, 
uh, seem to be having financial trouble. Seems like there's a lack of direction, and you know, it, it's the Embracer Group. Just seems like at any day we're, we're going to find out that they folded, and all of these studios are now, you know, <laughs> publisherless, and they're either going to have to figure out how to be indie studios, or they're going to get picked up by other companies, um, you know, like Tencent, or unfortunately, you know, that's a that's a real possibility. Uh, or PlayStation, or Sony, or EA, or you know Ubisoft, or whatever, and um, it, it's just it's going to be interesting to see what happens with Embracer Group because I think that's going to be a a big issue sooner than later. Um, you know the, the the biggest acquisitions that have been floated in recent years have been uh, something like Sega going to Xbox or Square Enix going to Sony. Um, what what you found is a lot of these companies, you know, the heads of their companies being like, no, we're we're not interested in being acquired, um, you know, to the point even, or I believe it was Sega who said about Xbox, like, oh, that's very flattering, but no, thank you, <laughs> we're good. Um, I just, um, I I think. You know, while I have said that I'm not as anti-consolidation as a lot of people are, that everyone has their limit, right? Like there, there will come a point where too much is too much, and uh, you know, I, I think Xbox is going to be quiet for a while um, after all of this drama. I, I suspect even just from a fan exhaustion point of view, or at least people who really pay attention to this stuff. I think all of us just want a break from talking about Xbox acquiring anything. <laughs> and so um, I, I, I suspect we won't hear from them for a while. But PlayStation wouldn't surprise me if they continue to, uh, to to pick up studios that, you know, Square Enix is a big one for them where it's Square Enix might as well be a PlayStation studio in a lot of ways, um, even though they have shown a lot more signs recently of working with Xbox more. And supposedly there's a lot more games from Square Enix coming to Xbox sooner than later, though a part of me has seen that as a power play by Square Enix telling Sony like, hey, if you guys don't buy us. We're going to start working with the other guys again, and you guys don't want that because you pay us a ton of money to keep like the Final Fantasy remakes and to keep a bunch of these games off of their platform. Well, you know, you, you got to put a ring on it is what it seems like they're saying, at least in my opinion. So we'll have to wait and see what happens there. Um, I'm not as concerned about these like smaller acquisitions of um, you know the way that Sony acquired even the way they acquired Bungie was pretty chill because Sony acquired Bungie and not PlayStation um, and even the way that like Sony recently picked up a studio that all they do are PC uh, ports and you know with an obvious intent to put more of their games on PC even though they tend to wait two or three years to do it and um, I just think um, I I think that's going to end up working out uh, in the long run doing those kind of deals, because, again, these big blockbuster deals like ABK going to Xbox or a potential um, EA being purchased by Disney, like after what happened here, I think a deal like that is even less likely to happen. But we will have to wait and see. PlayStation 5's big refresh has been officially announced finally. There's been rumors for quite a while. Um, there's two different rumors with PlayStation 5 where there was this slim console that was being rumored with a detachable Blu-ray drive and stuff like that. And then there's still rumors of a like a pro version of their console that's supposed to come out in 2024. I think that pro console is pretty unlikely, especially with more and more rumors coming from Xbox that they are not looking to do a pro console in this gen. Um, a pro console, like in one way, it could be like a knife in the chest and a twist by Sony if they did a pro console that is legitimately significantly faster than the Series X, uh, especially if Xbox does have no answer to that. Um, it would kind of drive you know the stake in even deeper to a point in this generation um you know if they are able to say like you can play all your games at 4k 60 fps on the new playstation 5, 5 pro that, that'd be a big selling point and, and honestly i would even consider right um even though i have a pc that can do that stuff fine i'm a console freak uh, um and 
but when it comes to this refresh, um, everyone's calling it a slim. It's more of a refresh because this new PlayStation 5 model is replacing the old ones. And so the, the old PlayStation 5, there is a $400 digital console and a $500 uh, Blu-ray uh, disc drive console, uh, which is 550 in most other markets. Um, the, the new one is slightly redesigned. It's kind of funny that Sony isn't marketing it as a slim because it's not. It's uh, I believe it's like an inch shorter and it's a, it's a little bit less wide, but it's still a big old honker. Um, it, it blows my mind. Uh, the conversation about the aesthetics of the PlayStation 5 are so useless because who really cares? It turns into pure console war stuff, but man, it's ugly. I hate that thing. It's so ugly, <laughs> but some people love it. And I, I'm sure it partly comes down to personal console bias. And, you know, everyone has their uh, you know subjective thoughts on aesthetics and things like that. Um, I guess this one looks a little better, but it's still ugly as sin. Um, but... Uh, it does have a few things that people are excited about. Uh, its internal SSD has gone from around 800 gigabytes of storage available to uh, basically a full gig. So they must be putting a, a little bit larger um, base SSD in that thing uh, so that after formatting and the operating system being installed, it still gives the full one gig of memory that it was uh, it kind of promises. Um, it now has four panels on the sides instead of two, like the previous gen. And um, obviously, there's some people miffed about that because, uh, you know, they there's people who are going to buy this, even though they already have a PlayStation 5, even though. And let me reiterate, there's no power boost. Uh, this this what this new console is, is it's probably more efficient. It's probably more efficient from a hardware perspective, and it's almost certainly more efficient from a production uh, perspective. Uh, they, they are likely using um, CPUs that you know are smaller than ever, uh, and, and chips in general uh, that they've optimized to make as cheap, and they can make as many of them at once as they can, which makes things way cheaper. And the cheaper the console gets to make, the more profit they make. And that's especially interesting because they raise the price of the digital edition. The current PlayStation 5 or the OG one has a digital and disc edition and the digital is 400 and the disc is five. The, with these new consoles for 450, you get the digital and for four uh, for 500, you can get a, um, a, a combo pack that comes with the Blu-ray drive, but it is still detachable. If you buy a digital edition for 450, um, and then later on decide you want the blu-ray drive it's eighty dollars and that ends up making if you buy a digital and then add on the blu-ray it makes the console fifty or thirty dollars more than the current console uh all they already have which is frustrating right like that shouldn't be a thing uh because they are almost certainly making more money off of this new console because of everything i said before if you look at even uh, in the original playstation 5 there's actually been i think three different versions of it um they've aesthetically looked the same on the outside but i believe um i believe that the second or third edition cut down the amount of uh, cooling metal um so like the radiators and stuff like that inside by like more than 50 percent because they i think they realize and and especially if you look at the internals of the og playstation 5 there is a hilarious amount of metal in there where they way over engineered their uh cooling uh, system, which is a good thing. That's that's a huge positive. You would much rather them go over the top than go low, um, and especially with that design the way it is, you know they 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 were they probably thought they needed a lot more uh, cooling power than they ended up needing because you know the consoles don't work at 100 percent all the time, and people you know play games that are 10 years old and those barely even challenge the current systems, right? So. Um, I, I think the pricing of this new console is kind of scummy, uh, but overall, I, I don't think it's a bad deal. Um, it, it doesn't make me want to buy one. I was really hoping for a that it would start off at 400 bucks, uh, and I was maybe considering that. Um, now I'm kind of more looking forward to if they do like a pro version. Um, and I may do something like that or buy one of these after the pro comes out because they'll probably be cheaper. 
Um, the, the one last thing that is kind of scummy is they do all the marketing of the PlayStation with it being vertical. Uh, the problem is, is that if uh, the, the new one is going to come with this tiny little piece of plastic uh, so you can uh, sit it horizontal, sideways, flat, and that comes with it. But if you want to make it vertical, they're going to sell you a $30 vertical stand that will work with the new system, which is insane. That is so stupid. <laughs> it's just it's just like because you have to factor that in. So if the digital edition is $50 more than the old one, if you want to set vertical, it's actually $80 more. Uh, it's just like it's so silly. They, they But this is the move. You know, raising the, dig the digital price, charging $30 for a stand. Th these are the moves that a completely dominant player in the industry makes. If PlayStation had it, it if, if Xbox was nipping at their heels, they wouldn't do this. They, they wouldn't charge that, or at least they would include it, or they would charge like 10 bucks for it. But they have such a big lead that they, they don't have to care because they know people are going to do it. They know people are going to buy it anyways. They may even gripe, and then they'll get, they'll get out the credit card, right? So I, I think this is interesting. I, I think this lessens the chances of that pro console. Like I said before, if there's no plans for Xbox, especially after that big info leak, to do a pro, I, I, I really, Sony is such a frugal company that I think if they don't believe they have upcoming competition in that situation we're going to see both of the big platforms focus on the next gen that's going to come out in four or five years more than likely so i think this new console is interesting um, i'm glad they did make it a little smaller it probably looks a little better um, but for the most part this is just them probably putting out a console that makes them more money and um, has some kind of questionable pricing uh, situations but oh well in the least surprising news ever, John Riccatello is stepping down from CEO of Unity. So after all the drama over the last couple of weeks um, of, of Unity implementing this really crappy monetization technique, uh, the CEO who implemented it is, or who tried to, uh, is leaving. Now, there's a bigger story here. Um, a, a big part of that monetization change, I believe, was from a recent merger that Unity did with some big conglomerate uh, hedge fund type company. And uh, it's, it's pretty widely believed from the reporting I've read that uh, people from that company basically bought their way onto Unity's board and kind of forced this monetization thing. I'm not going to defend John Riccatello. This guy has been a nightmare everywhere he's gone, including some of the, the one of the worst eras at EA. Um, but he uh, was really probably basically was just doing what he was told to do. And what I think people need to realize is that he's basically being let go as a scapegoat because everyone already hates him. Uh, but he's being let go with a giant. Uh, retirement package or, or a separation package where he's going to make, I think it was something like a quarter million or quarter billion dollars or something, something silly. And um, I believe the next person in line to be CEO is one of the people from this hedge fund that they just merged with who proposed these ideas in the first place. So if people don't think that they're going to come back around to trying to implement those same policies, maybe with a better package or better, uh, you know, better marketing, uh, they're crazy. Uh, it's probably going to get worse, in fact. So um, I, I think Unity is in a weird spot because it's the most used engine in the world, especially for indie games. And I, I think that you won't see it drop off very quickly because most studios can't afford to just change engines if they're in the middle of production. And uh, so it will kind of look like things are fine for two or three years. But I think you're eventually going to see Unity fall off pretty hard. Um, I don't know if everyone goes to Unreal. There's a few other options that they can choose from. But we'll just we'll have to wait and see um i did see someone joke i believe it was jeff grubb saying that we're gonna see like john riccatello and bobby kodak do a uh, a podcast about being terrible at game ceos i have to admit i would probably watch even if it was just for entertainment value 
Uh, getting into some of the uh, other news topics, uh, we had Battlefield 2042 Season 6 has kicked off. I do intend on jumping into this. I really love this game. Um, I know it got a rough go at it when it came out, but it's been uh, a pretty darn fun game since. I've definitely fallen off over the last couple months because I was pretty obsessed with Baldur's Gate 3 and Starfield and a few other games. Uh, but as those games have kind of waned on me and I've had my time with them, I am excited to get back to playing uh, some Battlefield, getting back into some Mass Effect, things like that. Um, speaking of Mass Effect, there was a really cool post on their subreddit uh, this week where a um, th there's someone making a game. It's like uh, some kind of Ranoc related game. The description of it was really funny. It was like Ranoc Electric Boogaloo or something. And uh, what was interesting, what came out of it was they were doing a tech test using the MetaHuman uh, tech on a model of Liara that looked like it was pretty significantly upgraded and um, modernized. And it was really cool. I, I don't know why there was something just in my gut that was so cool about seeing this classic character shown on an extremely modern engine uh, with these really smooth um, animations and facial expressions and things like that, uh, that, you know, especially when you even go back and play the legendary edition, you start to notice like th those games are still great and they still look great. Uh, but you know, there's things that are dated, especially animations and things like that. So that little bit, um, is even more exciting for a, uh, mass effect fan as well as we're less than a month away from N seven day. So I plan on doing lots of coverage on that. Um, I do, uh, plan on I'm actually in the process of working on one would on what would be a monthly ish Mass Effect podcast uh, to just talk about speculation for the next game, actual news when it actually happens. And uh, it, it's a it's a show that um, I may not have a guest every episode, but it's one that I want to have a lot more guests on. And so uh, be on the lookout for more info on that. Uh, also be on the lookout for a big giveaway I'm doing. I'm giving away um, three uh, basically like merch packages uh, from BioWare's gear store. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll be starting that off uh, a week before in seven day and it ends a week after. So um, be on the lookout for that. I'm very excited about it. Uh, and then just for some content updates, um, consider joining YouTube as a member. Um, from what I've seen, it's the platform people are the, actually the most willing to support on. Um, I, ha I have memberships on YouTube now. So if you want to throw me five bucks or, or whatever a month, you can uh, through that platform. And um, like Patreon is, is cool, but I feel like I can give more direct benefit to people who are on YouTube or Twitch. And I believe YouTube has a better cut of more of the money that you give actually comes to me rather than getting a 50-50 split with Twitch. Uh, and uh, I also have a bunch of new merch and stuff like that that you can get through YouTube or through my Streamlabs store uh, in, in my uh, link tree link down in the description. Um, yeah, but the, the podcast I'm interested in, I, I'm, I'm, I think that'd be fun. Um, a big problem with this podcast is it's so general and there's so many podcasts that do this. They do this weekly news thing and, and most of them are so much bigger than me that it's really hard to find a niche and it's hard to find an audience with this show where a Mass Effect specific, even though you would think that that, that pool of listeners is smaller because it's more focused, um, I'm more likely to actually, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if the Mass Effect podcast ends up being more successful than this one. Um, simply because podcasts that have much more narrow focuses, but that still have a large audience tend to do a lot better. So um, be on the lookout for that. I'm really excited to dive into a new little project. Uh, once again, it's been a while. Uh, we have some listener questions. If you have your own questions, be sure to check out the Google form uh, questionnaire that you can uh, get the link to in my discord or on my uh, Twitter page. Uh, you can just ask questions in my discord. The link for that is in the link tree link in the description. Uh, you can ask questions in the YouTube comments for me to answer next week, or you can hit me up on Twitter at Bond Diesel or at the bonfire if you want to ask questions that way. Uh, the questions this week come from Master Prime. 
what theme would you like to explore in the next Mass Effect? Um, a pretty big thing I've talked about with that is I would love to see it be kind of like a political thriller and kind of a, um, I've talked a lot about how I think there's going to be these big power vacuums in the Milky Way and the Citadel would love to take that back over and, and reestablish their kind of dominance over the galaxy. But I bet there's going to be other factors in play and it would be really interesting to see the Citadel challenged by other forces, especially if those forces aren't just bad guys. Um, it would be really interesting to see an alternative good guy pop up in the Milky Way in the wake of the Reaper War and to give some conundrum of like, well, the Citadel makes, you know, the Citadel Council is very imperfect. And, you know, we, we're, we're being faced with this other force that seems to have learned the lessons that the Citadel didn't. And that maybe they're the ones who should have more control over the universe and how those conflicts and stuff will happen and how our own characters could end up being kind of torn uh, amongst, uh, you know, allies. Um, I'm really uh, I, I hope that's what they go for is kind of that political thriller uh, kind of uh, vibe. Uh, second question, uh, would you give Andro uh, the Andromeda team another chance? Um, oh, yeah, for sure. The thing about the Androm Andromeda is that they basically use some of their support studios or their support teams to make that whole game. And that's kind of one of was one of the big issues. Um, and I, I suspect that uh, this next game, like I, I assume those devs are involved in this next game. I mean, the, the, the lead might gamble on the next mass effect was the lead or one of the, I think producers or something on Andromeda. So it, it's obvious that Bioware isn't really holding it against uh, those Bioware folks. Uh, that worked on Andromeda uh, because a lot of them, the ones who are still there, are in leadership positions on this next game or even on Dreadwolf. Uh, and would you like another Battlefield Hardline or something similar to it? If you don't know what that is, Battlefield Hardline was basically like a cops and robbers Battlefield game. And it was amazing. It was so fun. It was really, really cool. I loved it. In today's political climate of people having, you know, some interesting thoughts about police and stuff like that, maybe that Hardline 2 isn't the answer. But what it was, was it was kind of like a heist game, but with a Battlefield spin. I I think it's an interesting situation for Battlefield. Something like that would be really cool and I would like it. But I think Battlefield needs so badly for their next game to reestablish themselves as like the Battlefield guys and not trying to do all this goofy stuff. Battlefield 2042, especially on release, was such a weird, like it was such a Fortniteification of Battlefield. And, um, and they were chasing that trend. And they also had like that extraction mode that no one played. Uh, so they were, which is what I think the game was originally meant to be, was an extraction game entirely. And at some point, very late in development, they were like, holy crap, this isn't a Battlefield game. People are going to hate this. And they switched. Battlefield 2042 is in a really good spot these days, and we know that they're working on the next major title, um, and it's supposed to be, I think, like near future again. My guess is it's going to be like Battlefield 2042 2 or like 2.0, that they're going to embrace what people love about Battlefield and not try to do all this goofy stuff again. So uh, we're doing like the operators and stuff like that. Like I tolerate that, but I don't like it. And I don't think many people do. So another hardline-ish game would be really cool. I'm not expecting it because I think they have other goals they need to uh, go after. And that's where we're going to wrap this show up. So uh, thank you so much for listening. I really do appreciate it. If you have any feedback or thoughts or questions, uh, please be sure to hit me up in one of the ways I described. You can find me all over the internet as Bond Diesel, including over on Twitch, where I do stream a few times a week. Uh, and I multi-stream now. So if I stream there, I'll be over on YouTube as well. And you can support on either one of those platforms. Um, I've been trying to make it easy for people who want to kind of help me keep this thing going uh, to do so 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 check that out when you have a chance um, if you want to uh, support my content in other ways you can check out patreon.com slash bond diesel you can subscribe over at twitch especially if you have a amazon uh, prime sub so be sure to use that don't let amazon keep your money uh, and you can check out my merch and other content in the link tree description uh, down below 
or in the description if you're listening. That's all I have for this one. So until next time.